we're talking about with natural building today specifically is looking at um, and, and how it relates to the permaculture movement and not just movement but the, the culture that permanent culture that we're after as designers, builders, livers, and beings here. We're what we're trying to do is work with materials that are readily available, work with methods and techniques that are um, I like to think of it that are indigenous to our landscape. And something I've struggled with a lot is in cultural transformation is kind of pulling bits and pieces from different cultures and hoping to end up with this amazing result by doing so, whether it's religious or spiritual traditions or whatever, like this melting pot style approach, how to not water down. And to me, uh, in building, what it kind of comes back to a lot is looking at, um, really specifically at what, what's been done here. How do we work with that in a modern context? So how do we take 10th century, 19th century, 21st century stuff, bring it together, and I think holding on to the ethics and, and values that are indigenous to a landscape are, uh, is a really special and unique approach that we can take. And that inherently leads itself, I think, into permaculture. And uh, I hadn't quite, when I started in natural building, I hadn't been so, I hadn't had the aha uh -huh moment of like, oh, that's, that's permaculture, that's like, that's shelter and structure in a perm permaculture context. But to me, it's looking at the indigenous values in our landscapes and in our culture uh, that is now happening here on this continent at this time and say how what makes sense to build. So climate and material selection and working with people and building community and all of these types of things, you know, just kind of inherently bring themselves back to, you know, it's like, it's good. It works. It's lasted. It's stuck around for a while. So, okay. So when we get into materials here, let's put them all up. Go in the expedited version. Here, so. um, that's kind of what we're after in material selection. So locally available, um, minimally processed, renewable, biodegradable. Oh, and anybody taking notes, definitely invite you to feel free to write as much down. But this is all available as a PDF. Steve saved it for me last time to give a PowerPoint to a PDF, and I'll email it out to everybody. So um, do, I don't know if you still have it on your computer, and want to do if you have the email list, or um, or I can do it. But, so feel free to take notes if it helps think of things later, but don't feel like you need to get every word. Just they use lots of things. Okay, healthy for people, plants, pets, greater human and natural communities. So very doable. And um, yeah, there's engineers and architects and so on who are more likely to be getting more and more involved in that as cheap fuel and global mindset kind of shifts back to localized construction. So, okay, um, in a second we'll break down the northeast climate a little bit, but uh, you all see if I'm standing? Okay. Right. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we're after. And um, thermal mass we'll talk about it a little bit more, but um, so different materials are going to provide different functions based on on what you're looking to do. So we're going to skip totally over the protective bit, <coughs> covering bit, the hard skin aspect, but so we'll talk mostly about structure and insulation and thermal mass. And that last bit, there's, it's not that hard to engineer products that can do a fair amount of these things, but that last one I think is really big. Um, really just comes back to what you love you will protect and you will maintain and you will be a part of and it's pretty, there, there's a lot of really wonderful, high-performing, 21st century conventional buildings that are so stagnant and stale. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's kind of a judgmental phrase to put out, I don't really mean to be so judgmental with it, but there are very, um, they could be anywhere, they could be kind of picked and plopped up and put wherever. So that other aspect that I, I think is really kind of vital is just kind of putting it in the context of your local community and making it kind of special and unique place. And your material selection has a huge, huge role in that. Other things like air movement and uh, window selection, and all these other architectural features and performance features are really important. But your overall just kind of like craving for a space is very, very important. Okay, so let's break that down to the southwest here. So, I, um, so, 
little biography really quick is I did my little bit here at D Acres for not nearly long enough to really absorb a lot of what was happening, but as part of my quest to learn a lot about how to live, essentially, I guess that's what it boils down to. Uh, and I went off to graduate school doing environmental education and advocacy and really kind of focused on this um, little anger based, I would say, um, you know, a little testosterone filled young 20s kid really upset how the world is being treated and didn't really know how to constructively deal with that and a whole bunch of things led me to um, work at a college up in Ohio and then lead a big semester long um, trip through the southwest following the Colorado River from its origins in the Rocky Mountains to where it should end if there was water left in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, it doesn't make it there anymore uh, on most years. So uh, ended up on the Hopi Reservation in, uh, in Arizona for a little while and worked with this woman who had studied cob building, cob construction, which is actually what we'll be working on when we go class to later on. The cob oven, which is one great context of cob that makes sense here this time. So I learned how to build a cob house. And man, was I just out of, out of touch with, um, with my goals after that because I thought for sure what I was going to do was come on back and build a cob house here. Mm -hmm. And I got on back, and uh, I had yet to really figure out this um, insulation and mass and structure bit and how it relates. So, um, so here's why. So, cob is is a material that is. It's there are raw materials in there are techniques. So, cob is actually not a material. It's a mixture of uh, sand and clay, and sometimes a couple other additives, and usually some sort of fiber based um, thing like straw or. Um, horse hair or, or something for some tensile strength so things don't get pulled apart. Um, so in the southwest, all of those things are very plentiful. Sites will really dig it up, you create your foundation of your house or your entire roof, like dome style roof right out of what is under your feet. It's really quite remarkable. Um, but they have, while they have a lot of rain, it comes in very short spurts. There's only a few big storms a year that account for like 80% of the uh, entire precipitation. So, and clay is called hydroscopic or water living, so it can really deal with water very well in short bursts, and then there's a lot of chance for it to dry out and um, uh, kind of diffuse back into the air around it. So here in the Northeast, obviously, we're kind of pounded a little bit more. The demands we put on our structures here are just, it's, it's really kind of unbelievable to me. So we can have from negative 40 with wind chill to 105 degrees in, in little pockets of microclimates and certainly much, much, much hotter on like a, a metal roof structure. It's an like entire thing happens between a roof and like the living space in the building. Like what goes on up here on a hot day, like two hours from now, and what goes on there in the dead of January, it's like it can be 200 degree variation. Um, and we can also, as <laughs> this is a pretty good week to talk about uh, fluctuations, but we, was it? Last weekend, I remember having like wool socks on, going to bed with wool socks and a sweatshirt again, and then two days later it was like 96 degrees. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really, really, or maybe it's the other order. I think it was really, uh, really hot last weekend and got a little chilly. So, that's in like a 48 to 72 hour window. That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing to ask materials to deal with that long term. <laughs> So what we really need to do, of course, is to kind of work with knowing our climate, knowing our change in climate, and working towards like resilient structures that can deal with what we demand of them and ask of them, hope of them. And then um, also just um, kind of look at the innate abilities of the materials. And then it's not so, not so drastic when it's what they're meant to do. So it's a foreshadowing all the talk about clay further into. This is the stuff anyone who builds a house thinks of. Maybe, well, maybe the exception of thermal mass. It's not always thought of. But um, these are the things that almost anybody is going to factor in when they're designing a house. And any conventional architect anywhere in the world is going to deal with this stuff. And I think <coughs> the goal as permaculture designers is to go a bit further. You know, linking indoors to outdoors, linking the garden space to the kitchen space, and linking air movement, circulation, and flow from what happens outside to what happens inside the structure. But, so here's just that basic list of uh, everything. By building systems, green building strategies, that's plumbing, electric, mechanical ventilation, or whatever other kind of features are at work. So a lot of the materials Josh has been employing here for 
configuration. So we've probably seen a lot of these, but I think it's pretty important to note the unique nature of doing so. Or like for example, live edge rough sawn boards that are the plumbing around here, from outdoor kitchen to greenhouse to other sun spaces and so on. Um, that's as native as it gets, and you've probably been talking and thinking about that for a while. The um, yeah, I mean, sawdust as a byproduct, I think, is a good segue, and straw actually is a good segue as well into thinking about what uh, can often be seen as um, waste material. You know, into closing the loop and integrating that back in in one way or the other. So I don't know offhand what like, having a hunch you have a lot of use for sawdust drained here. Probably composting toilets is a big one. It can uh, there's a insulating wall system called wood chip clay, which um, I'll show a couple pictures of in a little while. But um, it's a form where that's a um, building strategy where you've got wooden lath on two sides and you fill it with uh, all these different sized aggregates of wood chips from like you know, fist size, or maybe not quite that big, but one and a half to two inch pieces of, of wood chip all the way down into some sawdust. And so sawdust is actually as an insulating material um, works relatively well. Um, not loads and loads of it by itself, but integrated in the system. Um, straw, certainly. Lime is one. Um, I'm going to talk about lime just for a moment now, um, breaking the rule on not talking about plastering yet. But lime is, uh, does anybody grow up on Lime Kiln Road or have a Lime Kiln Road in their town? Everybody, anybody not familiar with a place called Lime Kiln Road? So, is it a few folks don't, and a lot do. It's, um, there was like, there's maple, uh, I looked this up, or I didn't look it up, I came across it. There's maple, Main Street, High Street, um, Ash, and a few other, like, kind of very, very, very common street names throughout, but making the top ten list in New England is Lime Kiln Road. And um, so many, many towns have them or had them. A lot of them might be class six roads or maybe not used as much anymore. So lime, for a very long period of time, was a uh, predominant building material here in the Northeast, throughout the world. And uh, did anybody know why it kind of fell out of favor? Something replaced it. Concrete. Yeah, Portland cement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as uh, um, the aggregate component in concrete. So, um, yeah, so lime is, it's a, Local material, it meets most of the criteria I talked about. Um, minimally processed is something that I threw out there, meaning not a lot happens to it before it's usable as a material. And lime actually has, um, it's less embodied energy than concrete, but it's still pretty darn high. I think you have to heat it to 61 or 6300 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a lot of wood or charcoal goes into heating it in these old lime kilns that are a plenty around in them. But, um, it, it had it has structural purposes and protective purposes. And the biggest way lime is used now in this climate, um, where in the UK it's still used predominantly, it's, it's one of the, the major materials. Uh, they make roads out of it and uh, house foundations and all sorts of things, it's still used much more frequently. But here, the, the biggest way that, that I use it, most of the natural builders I know work with lime is just as a component to plaster. So we'll be plastering outside with clay and sand and manure and straw, and those are all those are uh, basic ingredients to it. But the cob oven that we're going to work on has a roof over it, and if it did not have that roof, where we're looking to supplement the protective capabilities of the plaster, keeping the oven. It's kind of hard to segregate those because an oven, and the plaster, it's attached, so it's not. It's, the plaster is a layer of the oven as a whole, but the, the burning chambers, for example, in the oven, protecting all like, the vital bits of that oven, we would, without that roof, we would probably have a lime plaster. Uh, do you have lime plaster anywhere here? Have you used it anywhere? So it's, uh, it's more durable than just straight clay, but um, it, what it does is it minimizes maintenance and um, Certain parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, it's got a long, long vernacular history where um, something happens called lime washing. There's some photos of it later. It's almost like a paint or it's a resealing of, of lime plaster. So there's these decisions you make as a designer that kind of lead you to different maintenance patterns. And with a clay-based plaster, 
or wall system, um, you end up kind of going down one route. I and mean, you can do milk paints and clay paints and certain things, but you don't go just putting um, lime on as a final coat unless you kind of built up to that. In a lot of parts of the world where lime plasters have been employed for in the same buildings for hundreds and thousands, literally for thousands of years, um, lime washing is part of their ritual of maintenance. So uh, a lot of um, a lot of community structures and churches and temples and so on have been built over time where lime washing is just part of like the yearly task people come to build. So here, like, people who have decks made out of wood often stain them every 30 years or something like that. You know, lime washing is very, very similar. I've built a fair amount of houses that have uh, lime plaster as part of it and lime washing has to happen. So that's kind of the list. Um, the second to last one there, animal hair, blood, urine, manure. That one might be a little off-putting, but uh, certainly usable in certain ways. Um, they're, they're, none of those are typically used in isolation. You don't have piles of dung as your wall system, but they're uh, smaller ingredients. So we kind of go you know, working our way down. Um, cordwood, does everybody know, does anybody know what cordwood is? So, uh, and there's different ways to work with cordwood, but it's you can make a wall of any thickness. <coughs> I think six or eight inches is probably about the minimum, up to 18 or so inches of split wood, and with a mortar of either Portland cement or cob. And um, yeah, it, it's a. Anybody want to make some guesses? There's kind of a continuum there uh, in a lot of these materials. Which I think there's a slide coming up but, of insulating capabilities and. Uh, thermal mass capabilities and cordwood. Doesn't the cordwood move the, the temperature through? It does, yeah. So a lot of the walls that we'll chat about have um, this one major factor going for them, and that's mass. Not even just thermal mass, which we'll chat about in a moment, but thickness, absolute, um, you know, thick monolithic style walls. And again, most of these are pretty flexible. You can do all sorts of dimensions. Straw bale is kind of fixed. You've either got, you've got a bale, you can orient it in three different ways, flat, lengthwise, or um, like on the flat, on edge, or up to down. But, um, which I've been up to down, I don't think you ever built with and never seen it. But that one's pretty uniform. You're stuck with some kind of standard sizes, but everything else you have a lot of um, control over of, as a designer, how thick you want to make something. Um, but um, monolithic walls are an absolute, not prerequisite of natural building, but they're kind of embedded. Worldwide, they're um, lots and lots and lots of material uh, kind of go into these buildings or structures or ovens and walls and so on. Um, anybody want to think of, um, if there's lots of materials, what else is there lots of? Weight. What's that? Weight. Yeah, weight, absolutely. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking that specifically, but absolutely. Yeah. I don't know, labor. You got it. <laughs> yeah, that's the big one. So, gonna, um, as we go a little quicker, then um, quicker through this stuff, and we'll just throw out those key points to be thinking of. And labor is a huge one. And that's the principle of using, it's not inherent in natural building, but most folks who are in a natural building and kind of choose human labor over mechanical labor, or human energy over mechanical So just kind of be thinking of that as we're talking about these systems. It's a, a lot of that is um, like building a 9,000 pound house or something, or, or even like a three or 4,000 pound wall system on just one side of a house. There's a lot of human energy goes into it. So just be always kind of going back to that, uh, that aspect. Sorry, what is Waddle and Dob? Sure, oh yeah, okay. Um, Waddle and Dob, there's probably a photo or two coming up of it, but Waddle and Dob is an old strategy. Um, sometimes it's called lath and plaster uh -huh. now, but it's, it's similar. <coughs> but yeah, it's... Um, got that. Okay. What? A lot of old horsehair plaster. Yeah. That's, that's what that is? Uh, horsehair plaster over a wooden lath. Yeah, it's in this continent, over the last couple hundred years, lath and plaster is a pretty popular, well, it was until 75 years ago. Before drywall, it was a really predominant building style. Back in the UK and other parts of the world, but really in the UK, 
uh, Waddle and Dog was a major, and in Germany actually too. So that's what that is. Waddle and Dog is a horse scare faster. Very similar. It's the same strategy. So Waddle and Dog, at its root, is um, using one inch or less diameter sticks or saplings woven yeah, together yeah. to form like a structural matrix and then coated on at least one side, usually both sides, with some sort of plaster. Lath and plaster is, you know, it's, um, the difference with lath and plaster is usually uh, the lath is a uniform dimension, usually three eighths of an inch up to three quarters of an inch, and it goes over stud wall framing mm -hmm. um, almost universally. So uh, Waddle and Daub might have had like, uh, timbers, like heavy timbers, 10, 8, 10, 12, up to 16 feet apart with other less uniform things happening. So, and like the waddle, the, the matrix part would be um, chosen to perform the structural needs to space, whatever that was. And lath and plaster, it's a bit more conventional, more uniform. So it's usually 16 inch on center, 24 inch on center stud frames. So it's became pretty common in, in the last 75 or 100, 150 years. So, so the northeast centric bit of here. Uh, wait, someone just did an earth check presentation? Okay. So um, those are not necessarily um, common to find around here. We've seen variations of it in the northeast, but um, so they don't make this list, but definitely good natural building strategy and site specific. Um, slip straw. So has everybody heard of straw bale building? Slip straw building, was that, people heard of that one at all? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take a moment on that. You know, I'm gonna pass a couple books around too. Um, let's see. I'm gonna weed out the plastering ones for now. We'll get those going there. Let's start. Two over here. So uh, one of the books going around had kind of featured slip straw construction, um, or sometimes called light straw clay, if that uh, rings a bell. But the difference, um, same materials, so it's straw, clay, some sort of wooden structure, and then some sort of plaster. So straw bale, um, straw is put up dry, so in baled straw is put up dry, and um, stacked on top of each other, and there's no formwork necessary to hold it together. So you might have a post and a post 12 feet apart, and straw bales are they're pretty burly, so they can uh, stand their own weight, and so you can just kind of stack them, form them up together, plaster them. Uh, the slip straw, you build um, every few feet, usually two and a half to three and a half feet build, it's called a truss. Um, so it's a couple pieces of wood, uh, like two by twos or two by threes, some sort of um, light framing construction, um, whatever your thickness of your wall wants to be, so 8, 10, 12, 14 inches thick. Uh, and you hold them together, so you, and you, every three feet or four feet or whatever, you put these trusses around and you um, break bales of straw apart and mix it with clay. So what you do, you're, by mixing with clay, you embed clay in every bit of that um, that straw mixture. So straw bale, the big distinction is straw bale has. Um, um, you, you had that. Yeah, this is straight. Yeah, yeah. This one. Um, straw bale is the intention is to always keep the straw dry. So it goes in dry. You're supposed to keep it dry, and so it, there's certain design characteristics that you have to <coughs> accommodate. They have to really not optional, um, put into your design. In straw clay, it's similar, except um, the, by embedding the clay into the straw, you kind of prepare for, you're giving water in the form of liquid water or water vapor to kind of permeate through your wall. So it's okay if it gets a little bit wet, it's gonna kind of diffuse up. Uh, moisture is something that's always kind of managed for in, in a full design, but. Just for now, like the, that's the kind of distinction. And another thing that I like to think about with the um, straw clay versus the straw bale, uh, straw bale insulates better. It's a 
to usually a thicker wall and it does insulate a bit better. Um, but what it requires is mechanized straw bale production. So straw is typically a waste product. It can be it's used in a variety of ways, but um, the baling of you know, having a, a baled um, chunk of straw is a process is, is a mechanized process. It doesn't happen. You don't find it. Um, so getting to use like these days, like if we're going to use straw we, uh, for a straw plate, we usually break bales apart. But it's only because they've gone through the really conventional baling process. If there comes a time where a baler is harder to come by or not um, not a big part of the farming or community landscape you're a part of, straw is still going to be available um, once it's kind of gone through its, its, its other processing. Once it's no longer food for animal in the form of wheat, it's, um, or hay rather, you've now got um, you know, a straw byproduct that doesn't have to be baled. So you get to use a waste product without processing stuff. Um, that makes sense? Can I get a question? Sure. Don't you have to worry about spontaneous combustion with straw bale? Mm -hmm. No. With hay, you would. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Straw, um, where it could be a concern is if it's stacked, like, like on a barn loft or something like that. Mm -hmm. Very, very common for hay to spontaneously combust if it gets wet. Um, yeah, any of these, yeah, you want to keep it dry for other reasons. And once it's in the wall, it's not a concern at all. So the, the thickness that it exists in, uh, there it would not be able to generate any kind of large temperature. Um, it, it would not generate that on its own. Um, mostly because, well, straw has got, you know, you know if you, I'm sure everybody when they leave a the permaculture class is going to stop at the mobile station and get like a big slurpee, right? And you get like one of your big fat straws. What goes on in between that plastic tube? Which is exactly what happens here in straw. It's air space. So, and that's how things insulate. So whether it's wood chips or um, even fiberglass, that has some other components that, that work to insulate. But straw, what it's really doing is protecting or trapping air inside of the cell. And like your plaster is what does that. So um, the air spaces are what's vital. So as long as things are stacked the right way, there's going to be some air movement that's going to happen on its own. You're trying to minimize that, but there's always going to be enough through clay and clay lined <coughs> plasters, uh, even through cement plasters, to dry itself out to some extent. So nothing stays still. Nothing stays still. Not air, not water, nothing. So everything's trying to move all the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah? I was part of a workshop on housing this area. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I not, never got to see that project finish. It was just a weekend workshop that I didn't participate in. Great. But a couple years later, I actually was at another presentation where there was a slideshow that had some shots of that house where this beautiful timber framing that was actually done with trees inside had fungus growing all over it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so I never heard, it was a slideshow that had a lot of different discussions going on. But I wish I could have heard more analysis if that is not an appropriate um, uh, form of building for this area, or if it just wasn't done quite right, or if the site yeah. didn't support it um, properly. Or if you had any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so here's this thing. Here's like the caveat to all this natural building talk. Is like, as a human culture, we have thousands of years of constructing things with local materials. And like many things, kind of like, drifted away for a while, and as we come back, there's this kind of like relearning thing that's happening. So in the um, straw bale construction has been happening for about 100 years now, but really in the last 25 years it's been more popular. Straw clay has a minimal, uh, a minimal history in Europe, and it's pre it's, there's only a couple thousand structures made of that in this, on this continent at this time. So <coughs> the last 25 years is all this learning that's really happening. Um, it's, I think in the last 15, it's gotten a lot better. The first generation of straw bale homes, and like the, well, not first generation, but like the stuff built in the early 90s, most of it's gone. Or not gone, but has been like reworked in one way or another. Uh, there's just so many design questions that were not answered by those folks who got really excited. Anywhere from like the late 70s to early 90s, there's this kind of regeneration of, of building techniques and excitement happening. It's all wonderful. 
stuck, but it wasn't just thought out. We're learning from some of those mistakes. My hunch is, in that building, first thing that comes to mind, so in straw bale, a benefit is you, straw bale versus straw clay. In straw bale, you put these up dry and you can start plastering them very, very quickly after. In straw clay, because you're mixing that clay with, um, with the straw, you're actually mixing in a fair amount of water and you need to let it dry out. And in this climate, that can take anywhere from two months to an entire building season. So I've actually built straw clay and wood chip clay walls one year and not plastered them until the next year because I want to give a lot of time to dry out. So my hunch is that uh, there's probably a plaster on one side or the other, probably a cement-based plaster, because those cause huge, huge problems because they trap moisture and wick moisture um, upward from a foundation right up into high cavities of the wall, circulate these, these loops of moisture that it would find its way into the wall by waking up and falling down. And there's all this movement of moisture. So it's probably either moisture that was trapped inside or moisture that found its way in through a cement plaster. Can I jump back to the waddle and dog question? There's two forms. This is a, um, a kind of a reed mat, and this is which is similar to an older one and dog. All three of these are different forms of the same thing. This um, this is bamboo with just a couple of four by fours, and that's actually a sheer wall, which means it's like it's engineered to um, provide an awful lot of resistance. It's that's an organ in an earthquake earthquake prone area. Um, and here is the lath and plaster where these uniform uh, pieces of lath or wood are spaced evenly all the way through, or mostly evenly, it's not too important, not perfect, but, and you kind of work your plaster in with your hand between them and it forms a really strong thing. And this is um, closer to, it's like a reed mat, that, uh, just a grass mat that's put up on a wall and that stuff is readily available just about anywhere you can get at Home Depot or something, put it over drywall. There's other ways to plaster over drywall for anyone who wants to do that in your own house, but um, you can just put it up on anything and just plaster over it, so it's just providing a substrate. But just three different types of uh, systems there. Would it have to go over drywall, or could it be put between like, nope. four by fours and plaster over? Would that be, not be enough structural support? It depends. So. Um, the reed mat, what you probably do is have like a more conventional waddle system, like lots of horizontal pieces, mm -hmm. or maybe vertical, whatever, but you'd have more than just 16 inch on center, but you wouldn't have to have a drywall. So those reed mats can span like a few inches, probably, I'd say, with some of them. I think I've done it over 16 inch on center. I don't know. This is what, um, the photo up here is what the straw clay looks like that I was just talking about. So these pieces, there's two by threes, kind of like every few feet, you put your window framing in and so on. But um, one thing I'll just point out, there's going to be a whole bunch of examples of really good foundations, this being one of them. This is the uh, Fazwall Agile. system, yeah, um, which I'll show a slide of in a moment. But um, yeah, this system works really good. So it's different than straw bale because the, the wood is embedded in there. What's the maximum span on a, from wall to wall that you can use a fast wall? Support? Um, from wall to wall? Like, like what beams? How far can you span? Is oh, on fast wall? Yeah. Uh, as much as the timber will do. Fast wall, think of it just like concrete. All right. know, think of it as like a straight concrete wall. Yeah, it's rated to be the same. You have fast wall decking also or just wall? That's it. Just walls, usually below grade. So in your situation, it probably work. But um, yeah, it's below grade, up a couple of feet. So what I'm trying to skip ahead to with it, um, you know, is this, this the concept of like a the design principles of having a good roof and a good foundation. Um, and Fazwall is probably the best foundation. What, what is Fazwall? Well, I'll get to it in a moment. But um, we were chatting about it last month. It's um, <coughs> it's a wall system. That, matter of fact, I think it's like next. Oh, there's what just regular straw bale looks like without the wood embedded. Okay, I think the faz wall is coming up. Yeah. Okay, let me just get all these things. Are you going to talk ICF or not? We're going by that. Um, well, here's a, here's a ICF system. 
So a fast wall is a really unique insulated concrete form system. So ICF is becoming a bit more common um, as a foundation strategy. So when we work with a foundation in this climate, we need to be um, the, the conventional approach right now is to go four to five feet or seven feet, depending if you're building a new one or not. Four to five feet down below the finished grade level or finished ground and um, tap into something below frost line. And the idea with that is um, you know, if there's a lot of freezing and thawing that happens so at the water table, the house will not go up and down and crack and break and fall down. Under. So the idea is to get down deep. One approach for, for a long time, uh, even in natural buildings, there's either been like a conventional foundation of just a poured concrete wall with like a full basement you can see in, in lots of houses um, built in the last 60 or so years. Um, so, so just like a regular thick concrete wall, sometimes with some rigid foam uh, glued to the outside of it, or sometimes to the inside, insulating to the inside of it. Concrete with some sort of thing added to it for insulation. And by thing, like you can't really work with a straw or wood chips or natural materials uh, very easily underground level. So, it's because of moisture. So, so I'm going to come back to this moisture thing. But, um, so ICFs are insulated concrete forms. And what those are is um, anything that has it's like stackable things, so think cinder block or something like this, that um, some of them have foam on two sides and these plastic strips that kind of connect. And you just stack them, like literally like Legos. Mm -hmm. So you dig down a big trench and you just align it. And you have foam on the inside and the outside. Uh, and then you pour concrete in the holes. So they look just like this, except they're about one pound a piece. These are about 15 pounds a piece. But this is all just mineralized wood chip, which means there is zero organic matter in it. Uh, so no bugs want to eat it. We're trying to go towards this, something that will not rot. Uh, Fazwall is as secure as anything. Um, is secure as foam for sure. So the wood chips are what happens inside a wood chip? Well, wood is there lots of? Air, air. Air, air spaces. So instead of like foam is trying to insulate by blocking airflow in closed cell foam, which is normally used underground, is trying to prevent the movement of air. Um, these have, um, these are part of like a system, so it's not a, a one material that does everything. Because foam is really good about keeping moisture from moving through, uh, keeping air from moving through, and being able to work with it under that. So you can still put the poly, the uh, polystyrene on the upside? No, 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 no. You, uh, this is, you know, so these blocks would get stacked together, just like Legos, whatever the shape of your house is. Um, and because this is a mineralized wood chip product, you can nail into it with just like a regular nail gun. So unlike a concrete wall where you've got like a special um, uh, ram set or something that you need to put screws that are inevitably going to crack the concrete and fall out, no matter what you do, uh, or without any toxic glues. So this you can put any kind of wood cladding on, like regular siding, right up it or down it. If it's underground, you can have uh, cement mortar over it or uh, uh, any kind of plaster over that is going to work fine. But normally it will just get um, get covered with wood of some sort. Um, so, and then this is what's called rock wool. So it's a naturally occurring material. It's like pulverized rock particles mixed with some uh, spun agent. I don't even know what it is to be honest. But um, yeah, it's, does anybody know what's in rock wool? Magic. Yeah. Yeah. It's using rocks. To is it? Is it something? Like, I mean, asbestos is kind of like that. But I yeah, there's no asbestos. Yeah. But, but uh, what like, else is like fiber? Is, is some vermiculite like gold. that? What's that? Is some vermiculite like that? No, vermiculite and perlite are like kind of powdered form. Oh, so yeah. this is kind of like rock wool starts as this and gets spun into these these bats that mm -hmm. just like fiberglass that you, know, you can just roll it out. Yeah, or I don't know. Cut it in pieces. In you can get it in big. Um, boards, kind of like rigid foam, or you can get it in a spun form. Um, and you just you take these pieces out, they're all pre-cut, and you just kind of stuff them in there, great insulation. So you've got insulation and structure, insulation and all of here, and then in there you... So the concrete. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, 
So that work that drastically minimizes the, the holes that you still see are filled with concrete, but you end up using 25 to 35 percent of the concrete, which that's one of the biggest um, uh, energy consumers on a housing project is uh, asphalt shingles and concrete foundation. So that's a great way to reduce that. And shingles are so they're inferior in so many ways. So um, without a lot of structural, without any lot, yeah, right. yeah. Well, probably somewat less structure than a full eight-inch concrete wall. But those are all overbuilt just to hold walls up. So a three-inch concrete wall would be totally suitable. Would be engineered to work in just about any circumstance in this climate, uh, as long as it's deep enough and designed correctly and poured correctly. But so eight inches is total overkill, total. Overkill. So this still uses more concrete than truly necessary, but you can do like an eight-story building on this without any problems. How many stories? Eight. So that's the biggest for foundation right. for. You can you can build walls of it, yeah. So what we use it for, what, what I use it actually is another product called Duracell. It's the same exact concept, and that one's available. All right. Yeah. Okay. Just a pun. <laughs> um, yeah, so it can be used kind of like below grade to get you about two feet up off the ground. And um, I swear I'm getting there with this like the good foundation detail thing. Good hat, good boot stuff. Yeah, there's <laughs> that as well. As a company, it's a very modular material. Um, the has well stuff, but it's for what it is, it's really good. What's the cost breakdown for compared to just conventional cement? Same to just less to just more. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it looks just about the same. So, um, it depends how you value your time. Because it's the user friendly technique, so you can do it by yourself or, you know, two or three people. So it could take someone who's worked with it a lot might be able to do it in a whole house in two days to form the whole thing up. If the first couple times you do it, it might take six days. So if you're taking time off from work where you could be earning a lot of money, then it's costing more. You know, thinking a larger scale. Uh, Material-wise, it's it's definitely less. But um, because of those other factors, it can cost a little more. So I didn't have any experience really, and we did three of us did a whole house in ICF block in one day. Yeah, yeah. But those are the lightweight foam ones? Yep, yeah. zip tied and then, yeah. and then you got a big shoring system after that before the concrete will catch you. Yeah. I don't know if you do a lot of shoring with this. Not if you do it right when you're yeah. early. Yeah. See, they have so much mat, they're heavy. Yeah, so, they're heavy. Yeah, so you don't, like, you kind of do it as you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's closer to masonry than Legos. <laughs> So, so you get big shipping costs, because is that, that's not from New England, is it? Fazwall is from uh, Oregon. Duracell is from is in Ontario with a distributor in Maine. So, so you shipping costs not that much? No. So a lumber supply or building supply store usually eats that. Like you buy it through them, so you're paying for it but in a hidden way. Everything is economy is hidden, you know? It's, yeah. But, um, but you're right, I mean, there's definitely embodied energy in the production and transportation. It's a good way to get around how much concrete and foam usually gets used underground. And I, it, that's something I've tried to work towards designing for a very long time. Is like minimizing the use of foam and concrete. So, uh, and metal. Right. So, you're still going to do your normal drainage system for your foundation. So mm -hmm. you keep the hydro, the, the water away from the wall. Yeah. And you don't have to, you don't have to do any <coughs> stick and peel or anything to it? Just straight to <coughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's probably going to be a good draining material, yeah. like you're saying there. Um, <coughs> straight underground probably would do something. You could put like a paper barrier or something like that. Um, yeah, and you could use some sort of like rock resistant um, cedar board cla uh, clabber or something like that, you know, or a, um, a treated pine uh, clabber or something like that. So your trench would need to be big enough to get down there and work with that. But I think a cement stucco over it would probably be the quickest, like a similar to a plaster, but to, as a moisture. No, I'm talking about the underground portion. Yeah, me too. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and above ground you can get into whatever you want, like earthen plasters. It's so that's what I was going to say. You can nail into it perfectly and like with no extra tools, and you can also do earthen. It's the best substrate for plaster that I've ever. Worked with. Yeah, it's better than straw bale. Yeah, for you know to plaster. So um, the big concept here is overhead. Big, big overhead. 
So two foot minimum, three foot better. If you can do even more, that's even better. So um, almost never a reason to not have at least a two foot overhang on any kind of natural. So, um, but what about the sun effect? The, the more of an overhang, the less sun you get. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. We're not going to get too much into that. It all depends on where you locate your windows, what your floor material is, and how it's going to come and interact and get stored as, as thermal mass, uh, what the actual pitch is. Um, there's a lot of different factors in there, but you want a big overhang. Yeah. Um, yeah, generally speaking, though, real basic concept on this is you want the winter sun and you want to block the summer sun. So you want to design your roof overhang that gives you great protection on the walls uh, and to me, just as important is, um, I prefer cold over warm, um, really want protection from the summer sun. So, yeah, so something like that works pretty good. Wouldn't want to have to actually roof that. <laughs> okay, so now that's by far the best example of uh, almost nobody's going to go through this kind of trouble to put their whole building several feet up. From a strictly um, non-aesthetic point of view, because it's not really integrating that building into the landscape very well. But um, that's the best roof and the best foundation that you can ask for. So all moisture obviously sheds away. So some variation, like take a little mental snapshot of that if you're ever designing a structure. Mimic that in a way that blends to the landscape. It makes some makes that work beautifully. But that's this is as good as it gets. Is that that's in Japan or Southeast Asia? Yeah, that's it. Sometimes a lot of rain. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, what's the advantage of doing that up here? Um, well, so aesthetics, just for functionality. Yeah. Energy okay. Efficiency. What? Well, the big thing, the foundation bit is we have lots of this white stuff that falls on us for four or five months yeah. out of the year. It builds up, builds up, builds up, turns to water when it gets warm. The last thing in the world we want is all that snow and ice making its way into the wall. So redundancy is kind of the big factor, what we're looking for. So anything that happens underground, you want to, um, you want to make that transition as, as beneficial as possible. But it's the edge effect. It's like where air is meeting soil in any way, shape, or form. That's where a lot of something is happening. You know, from a planting point of view, it's wonderful. From a building point of view, it's where vapor, where water turns to vapor, <coughs> where ice turns to liquid, where a transition is happening, and that needs to get mitigated. So, it's um, there's another aspect to we won't get too too much into, but foundations tend to be really really leaky of air unless they're really built right. So a lot of it's the biggest place on a building where air is moving in and out is that, or actually where it's moving in, then a lot of it moves out the roof. So there's this effect that happens like this. So a leaky basement, uh, leaking up water but with air, is not very, very tightly insulated. Um, a lot of air is going to come in, and with that air, it's going to bring all that moisture from outside. So that's why way more than like actual um, migration of water through the walls, in a basement, like where a lot of times they're wet, mildewy, moldy, and so on. It's if air comes in, carries moisture with it, and then it condenses back to liquid and settles in. So almost any old house in this climate, that's what's happening. So the idea is to kind of um, prevent that. So by providing some sort of insulation, <coughs> whether it's the wall or foam or any kind of foundation, carrying it before you transition to timber or straw or whatever, um, localized material you want to work with. Um, make that transition. If here's your group, if your ground is here, come up further. You know, and just um, carry through, carry all the way up. So the way you plant a tree, plant your house. You know, like think of that how you're situated and if it's too deep, it's no good. If it's up too high, it's no good. Situated like a strawberry plant. You know, those are the tree things. So, um, yeah. So it's just yeah, just making that uh, mitigating transitions. So, <laughs> any more questions on that? So there's actually a million different avenues to all that, but it's kind of quick. But the foundation, you just really want to think of it like you know, your protection from that edge zone, that thing, that multi generational aspect. That's kind of a, um, it's tricky. We're not trained to do that. We're very much trained, and I'm dealing with this. I have a 300 year old house, <laughs> and I'm going in there trying to like make 
lots of changes as like my family has grown and the needs are getting more and more clear and so on. And I'm thinking about all these things and it's a really tricky thing and these kids are gonna be teenagers and then they're gonna leave and you know, all of these things. How to really, really command the space. Is that? And then they come back. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Who knows what they're going out to with in this world. So um, anyway thinking about how to make spaces adapt. It's really difficult. So, um, if there's a design challenge out there, it's probably that. So, if there's a biggest design challenge, there's a lot of design challenges. So, the food bit is really huge, of course. Okay. So, you've done an niche analysis? Okay. So, thinking about how to do that on your own building. You could make a huge list, but I just want to introduce that concept of thinking of what those yields are and what they, that list can be so big from you know housing family members and something very direct to you know housing your winter vegetables or something that's specific to <coughs> it's li truly limitless on what you can ask of demand of and get out of a structure um, but you're balancing your your inputs available with with what's available so you're setting your goals for your whole site breaking it down, so not getting too far with your house design until you know what you've got on your land. You might have the best clay in the world. If you live in New Hampshire, you probably don't, but you might. If you might have perfect building sand, you know, and that might one you might be thinking, oh, I hadn't really wanted to get into natural building on this, but I've got the best sand I could do. Fantastic. There's a place, it's uh, down in um, Alstead. It's this like birch white sand, the most beautiful <clears throat> silica sand I've ever seen. And uh, this like, center, it's a, a retreat center that's been being built over the last seven or eight years. And um, it's all straw bale buildings, and they've been plastering. It's like, the most gorgeous plaster. And um, it's great. And they had, I don't know, they probably were already leaning towards it, but I'm sure it's, some of the folks who are living in these buildings probably thought that they would paint their houses. And they're all kind of like blending in. They just happen to have this wonderful scene. So, what are, <coughs> what are the inputs that are available on your site? So you might have trees, you can bring in a portable sawmill to frame your house, whether it's a timber frame or just two by fours or two by sixes or whatever it is. Um, and you can get uh, bring in the chipper. If you have a lot of pine and you get some timbers out of that, and you've got a lot of boards left, you can get your floorboards and then bring your chipper in and you can get a whole bunch of wood chips and insulate your house with that. Like you're, and then you've got sawdust up to finely sized aggregate up to pretty big sized wood chips all coming out of this tree and you know, the only thing you want to do is get rid of the bark or you know, kid, but it's not um, the bark of a tree is not a good building material. You don't want to make a guess kind of ties into what we talked about with the straw clay house. But moisture. moisture and because of the moisture what's there. Insects. Yeah. Insect and insect larvae you know, loves that layer between the that outer growing wood and the bark layer and the candy. So they don't Big necessarily chance. bother with chips that don't include bark? No, no. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, the we wood chips. Ants are, you know, we see ants a lot. And, uh, yeah. So, a wood chip clay house, um, again, they're really big. There's only one thing that I do different on a wood chip clay house versus a straw clay house, and that's I add a termite barrier. So, even though they're not a problem yet, they are clearly going to be this one. So 20 years from now, termites are going to be as big here as they are in Massachusetts and Ohio. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a major factor. Not an issue with that as well. No, there's nothing edible. Nothing edible there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but wood chips, and we call it a wood chip clay system because we mix. The best way to do it is like to rent a mixer, like a mortar mixer. Mix of wood chips with what's called a clay slip, which you're going to make and apply out on the, the oven. But um, it's just clay and water mixed, and clay is so so small that it held suspended in the water indefinitely, or at least very long term. So when you mix clay with water, it's it's a really great ratio. It doesn't settle out and become just water on some parts and heavier clay in other parts. When you mix a clay slip with good clay, it's it's a full um, Uniform layer, uh, and then so we mix the wood chips, the pine, the whatever kind of wood chip, but um, bark-free wood chips with that clay slip in a mixer. Make sure that everything is coated good, and that clay is a preservative that will work indefinitely. 
There's no limit to how long that that will provide protection from insects or water, as long as there's redundancy, that's this redundancy concept. So water will get in, bugs will get in, have to find their way, they have to find it um, undesirable. There's nothing there for them to eat. So the play is on there. It's not an issue. Yeah. Same thing, water will find its way into walls, even with a great overhang, great foundation. Us people have this awful habit of breathing. Exhale. <laughs> Why do we do that to our buildings? But we do. We cook, we shower, we do things. Moisture is like working this way out of this room right now. It's a nice crack in that door. It's finding its way. If we could see on that scale, there would be all sorts of water molecules finding their way, dispersing to where it's a less congested space out there. Same way heat would do. But, um, or I should say warmer air. It's not just warmer air. Do the same thing. Um, but, so moisture is going to find its way in, it needs to have a drainage plane at the bottom, so it finds its way into the wall, condenses when the temperature changes and it's not so dense, and it will condense down the wall as moisture, as an actual liquid, find its way to the foundation and find its way out. So, outward. Okay. Air moves this way, water can walk that way. If anyone wants to write this down, and I won't bring a computer up, but they can like read it off when we set up. Think twice, move materials okay. once. Yeah. So, there's no reason why the wall of a house or the roof of a house cannot also be a food growing medium. Again, if there's soil and there's soil you want to retain water, so you have to think through what other functions are happening, but it's very, very doable. Think of your house as the biggest trellis on your property. Think of it as you know, your garden as providing insulation to your roof. You know, these things are all very, very doable if you're on, specifically if you have limited space. Um, Otherwise, your roof is really good at capturing water. So, we actually, I did a uh, calculation for um, uh, for a project that wanted to capture rainwater and graft it down that way. And by putting in a purpose, there's a really small, I was trying to put the size of this room in a house, a little bit bigger, just a couple of small walls for one person. And um, we almost doubled the rainwater collection potential by just adding a purpose. So, their stacking functions is best possible. It's very, very doable. Um, think of that. So, in one sense, it's like, oh, if we're going to do the straw bale, I have to add the expense of a bigger overhang that's in more material out there. But then, like, what do you get from that? So, shade, which is definitely angle it to get shade, to get rainwater, to get gravity to that water and uh, free movement of water. So, stacking these things or thinking through your needs, your goals. <coughs> desires for the space and how to achieve it the features that exist. So, uh, that's not a bad little space. I didn't build that. I I wish it did. Oh, so what is it? It's just a overhang? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a patio. Yeah. So um, this is the, over here is the actual house. There's a door that kind of comes in. Here. This is at um, the, Canelo, the Canelo Project in outside of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Bill and Alethea Stein are the are writers who wrote one of the first straw bale books in the early 90s, and they're world-renowned plasters. They've researched a lot of traditional plasters from throughout the world. Um, there's a lot of, there's so much to it. When we're outside, I'll, I'll show a couple examples. But they've kind of rejuvenated, um, looking at cultural traditions, plastering, or finishes, not just plasters, um, and languages, and like how these things have kind of interplayed over time. Uh, they're husband wife team, they've been at it for about 30 years. Fantastic. So, this is at their space. I visited about six or seven, I guess, about nine years ago now. So, yeah. But, indoor outdoor transition. I so, uh, should mention, if you haven't come across yet the most expensive and worthwhile book, I can't think of indoor and outdoor transitions without thinking of like the book that threw it out there for me that's Pattern Language. Uh, has anybody heard of that one yet? <coughs> yeah, pattern Language. Christopher Alexander and, and his 30 billion students who contributed. But wonderful book. Very expensive, but probably worth it. Okay. So, yeah. This is, I think, a pretty profound <coughs> thing. Just kind of hold on. If there's a bumper sticker slogan on this microclimate. The siting of the building creates microclimates. How can you benefit from the location? Shape, height, color, and overhangs of the building. So, a lot of 
um, because of the high labor that goes into a lot of um, natural buildings, there can be an expense associated with that. So you can do it yourself, you can love the process, it can take five years to do it. it take a very long time, you can do it very good and uh, very cheaply, but it takes a long time. This is a continuum of, of the triangle. Think good, fast, cheap. Pick your space in that. Because you can have a wonderful house built in six months for you. It's going to cost you a lot of money. Or you can do it really, really fast and really, really cheap and maybe never want to go back. Can't have all three. You can't. But you can maximize what you get in that building by thinking things through clearly. And I really think that microclimate bit is absolutely huge. So, siting on the landscape, I, I glossed over a lot of the siting and solar access and wind access things. You'll get the PDF, but um, you're going to talk about that so much through assessment of your site as a whole. So it's kind of taking that into the, the, the micro level, thinking about your, your whole house. Some folks said you might be doing some building up. Calling them all houses for now. It might be a barn or a shed or an outdoor kitchen or a bunker. A bunker. <laughs> Could be. It's, yeah. Whatever it is, um, you know, you've got all these kind of <clears throat> options out there. So you're kind of like constantly honing down the same way you would in a forest garden from like this big like whole site analysis down to this, you know, your one patch design on a quarter of an acre to this one guild under one tree. It's the same thing with a house. You start at that whole macro scale of whole property and then how to situate that down. Uh, the, the middle size way to look at that is your, your whole house, like your zone zero, and how to really think about that. But then, working with microclimates on an even smaller scale, room by room, or side to side, wall to wall. And they by no means have to be rectangular, of course, but how to really work with that. So you want, um, ideally, kind of blending in the interior to the exterior as much possible in both materials and for, for air and water flow, for aesthetics and, um, yeah. The one, there's one exception to that, though, where you're trying to blend in door and outdoor. There's one place to have a good barrier. Take a stab at that. No, I wasn't even thinking that. Some of the best bathrooms I've ever been in have, like, well, two, there's usually just two walls. <laughs> you don't even need all four. The north side of the house in this climate. That's really a place to kind of focus some energy on. Um, houses that have any of these wall systems don't have to be insulated the same. On all, if it's a rectangle, all four sides, or whatever your shape is. But the north wall, typically, you want to be very properly insulated. Very deeply insulated. We really, really want to minimize air movement. West wall, each of the four directions kind of have their own capabilities to um, what you can get from that. And the north wall, you're going to get, usually think of your privacy gradient, or like working from a more public space to a more private space, and the north side of the house is usually pretty good for, like, for a den or a reading nook or something. There's no reason for it to be uncomfortable just because it's cold on the other side. But um, on privacy, you're kind of working towards a darker space, less windows, less penetration. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that really works in yeah, those other factors there. Yeah, specifically thinking about nutrients if you have a living roof, but uh, water and electricity are really the, the biggest things. Uh, a building can very easily be situated by minimal extra effort uh, if you're already passively designing or designing for a passive heating of the structure. Uh, you've already kind of got a decent roof angle and you've situated it with the right orientation. Uh, capturing rainwater and electricity tend to be pretty simple things. So net zero energy, this was just mentioned, it's a concept of um, being usually, almost always being grid tied and still having a connection to that exterior um, uh, energy system for at times of need, but uh, using your house as a generator. So over time, there's some extra design principles that go into it, but it's something that I'm working on my 300 year old house trying to convert towards um, making that uh, as electric as possible, so less less wood heat. Getting away from oh, there's actually a lot of wood heat. There's a big biomass system in there, but trying to convert appliances to as being electric as possible, with the hope of making my own electricity 
and to run it. So it's kind of like trying to close loops, but also keep that uh, open-ended connection to the grid, where over time you're producing more electricity than you're using. And by over time, that can mean daily, weekly, yearly, or generation, a lot like a solar panel, or wind turbine or something. But, uh, but the real goal there is to produce more than you consume. Kind of like your garden, kind of like your rainwater or water systems in general, produce more than you consume. Um, it's an expensive proposition at this point, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. But. So, net zero is it's, the last few years, it's, it's gaining momentum as a um, design standard. Uh, the idea with um, thermal bridging is um, how you stack your building materials together, how you organize them to, to minimize the flow of heat between spaces. So an interior to exterior wall, like right here, this wall is acting as both. One side is inside, one side is outside. How do we um, not make it so heat's just going flying through? And the, the big concept is using materials that don't um, readily pass heat between. So wood is a very poor, um, uh, wood is, a, is a, a very good conductor of loss. So, or heat movement, air movement. <coughs> so, wood on one side to the other, it's, it's almost like a channel. So, the wall yeah, stud yeah. is a channel so The wall stud, yeah, absolutely through. And then, there's this other thing, like a straw bale or a system like that, where we've got plasters working as, um, I think it's an important addition to this, I should add to this, is if you've got a wall system, say it's a 14 inch thick straw bale, it's a plaster on this side and on that side, it works as a stress skin. It, it's a self-fastening. It's a really important thing. So you're not putting holes for nails all through the wall system. Um, stress skin, It's uh, the idea is it creates a shear resistance. So if you've got something really solid and the wind blows and there's this tension compression, compression thing that happens. Um, same thing with like a long piece of wood. Like if um, it's supported in two places and it, it goes this way or that way, some fibers get pushed together, some get pulled apart. It's the same thing with a, a whole wall system. You know, there's this dynamic interplay that happens based on all the elements. Even heat in uh, conductivity is going to create movement of materials. Um, because of that, because of shear forces, specifically wind in our climate is the biggest factor, we've got this um, huge <coughs> need for engineered materials that have holes, holes, holes all the way through them. Um, so screws, nails, metal plates are all awful, awful conductors of so the idea is to minimize those. It's just yet another way, like a, a mass wall system, and it, you assist them very, very specifically because it, you know, it works all together. It's not these individual components, but when used appropriately and designed to be used appropriately, you you get to minimize all these thermal bridges. So there's other ways to do it, like this staggered stud approach up here. Um, it works pretty well, so we can do that. But this right here, weak, weak, weak. There's nails, there's wood. The good news is, I I don't know of anybody still, well, most builders, even conventional builders, are not really doing what you see down there anymore. Uh, New Hampshire Energy Code is, is three times more uh, stringent than it was a few years ago, almost three times more. So almost everybody has kind of taken some leaps and bounds from that 16 on center, put some plywood up, put some drywall up. I think we're out of time.